hello, welcome. My name is Jody Scholes. I am your instructor for the MBLEX review course. And uh, we're excited today to be here to study pathology. Hey, it's one of the seven categories you're gonna need to know. Um, and if you ever need to know what those seven categories are, feel free to hit me up in the message board on Patreon, uh, or just look it up at the Federation's website. They have a content outline. But pathology is a very fancy word for basically the study of dysfunction and disease in the body. There's some pathology. And we're gonna look at those today. We're gonna look at a few of those today in relation to how massage therapy affects them. So today is gonna to go down in three rounds. <laughs> I feel like Bobby Flay. <laughs> today is gonna to go down in three rounds, yeah. Uh, so the first round, uh, our first section of class is test taking strategies about how to prepare for this test. This is not like you know, any other test you may have taken, at least in a long time, right? Some of you sat back in high school for the SATs. Um, I'm old enough to have done that with a number two pencil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, content. Because part two, round two of our class today is the learning. It's a reminder of all of a bunch of different things you learned in massage school and maybe some things you didn't learn in massage school. Uh, and then our last round, our final round is dissecting questions. And I have, yeah, over the last month, Students, graduates, uh, and participants, patrons in our in our community have been coming back and saying, gosh, Jody, that dissecting the question thing, that's been really helpful. Uh, and it is a strategy you can go back to on game day. So that's round three. We go um, and we dissect some questions. So part round one, going to give you some strategy on the test taking. Round two section learning, going through a bunch of pathology today. And then round three, we're gonna dissect some questions. We're gonna apply what we've learned to dissecting some questions, getting to the best answer. I wanted to talk to you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whenever you're listening, uh, about how does this all work? And I wanna speak at first to patron, to all of my patrons, uh, to um, everybody in this community, how does the patron uh, site work? And how does the online learning center work? We're gonna spend just two minutes talking about this. And we're gonna talk about how does the MBLEX work? We'll spend a little bit more time talking about that. So becoming a member of patron, Patreon, you become a patron. You are pledging a monthly amount, anywhere between 12 and $199 to have access to information. We come together to study, even at, at our entry level at $12 a month, you are invited to these live classes. We do them every week on Thursdays at noon Eastern. On Patreon, there's also a message board and I'd really encourage you to find it. If you go and you log in to Patreon, if you go to community and you click on messages, you can send me a direct message. And so if you have questions, if you feel frustrated, if you just want to blow off some steam, send me a message. I'm watching, for those of you who are in the $20 or more, I'm watching you in the Online Learning Center. So the Online Learning Center is a different website. We've got the patron website, and we've got all the live classes there, all the recorded classes there, lots of encouragement there. But there's a different website, and that's the Online Learning Center. You go to it by following a link called the Business of Bodywork. And that's where we host, where I host, the full-length classes, the deeper dive classes. Um, what you're going to find in going through the recordings of these classes is that we can't get through everything. Yeah, we can't get through everything. I would love to, but there's just too much. So the online classes are condensed. They are thick. They are deliberate. They are a deeper dive into these topics. Um, ones that we can't normally take. So here we review 
in the online learning center, I teach. We touch on the subjects here, but in those online classes, uh, I teach. So the online learning center hosts the classes and it hosts the practice exams. So if you are at $20 or more, $49, $199, you get access to the A plus practice exam. Yes, that's thousand, well, uh, like almost 2,000 questions. You can take those MBLEX simulation exams, the exams that look like and feel like the MBLEX randomized questions uh, throughout the entire 100 question test. I ask that you do your best to finish that test in one sitting. That's the idea, right? To try and finish it in one sitting. Um, at this point, there is no time limit on this practice exam in the online learning center. However, your MBLEX is two hours and 100 questions. Yeah, you actually have about an hour and 50 minutes to take your MBLEX. That average is about 75 seconds, about 70 seconds per question. So you've got time. You have time. You can breathe. And you're very welcome, Deborah, about this information. So 100 questions on the MBLEX, two hours, about an hour, 50 minutes. Also on the MBLEX, you cannot go backwards. You cannot go back to double check. You cannot skip a question. You have to answer every question in the order it's presented to you. And so you will also have a clock, a timer on your screen when you're taking the MBLEX. It is ticking. And so take a moment before you start to Take a look, is that timer ticking up or ticking down? Usually it is ticking down. By the time it starts, it says about an hour, 50 minutes. That's when your questions start to arrive on your screen. You may be wondering, what happens in the first 10 minutes? Well, you sign in and you answer a little survey. That takes anywhere from five to 10 minutes. Um, usually closer to eight to 10 minutes to finish that. But it does get you making sure your computer is working, making sure you are who you say you are. Then you get your hour 50 minutes to take the MBLEX. Be aware of your timing. That is one of the benefits of taking practice exams in the online learning center. I can tell you how long you spent taking the test. For many of you, I say, oh, congratulations, you scored a 75 and you spent an hour and 40 minutes taking the test. That's what we're going for when we take the online practice exams. A, winning, a, a passing score is 70%. But I want you to look at your timing as well, okay? If you're getting through this test in 45 minutes, it's a little too fast. And if you're not passing, one way that you can add to your passing score, one way you can score more points, slow down. I know you just want to get it done. You just want to get it done. You just want to get it done. But here's the deal. I need you to have the ability to focus for an hour and 50 minutes. The secret sauce, that's the secret sauce right there. Your ability to focus. The majority of people, the majority of test takers who are not successful with the MBLEX finish in under an hour. They just went too fast. Because what we're gonna see today when we dissect questions, be careful of the answers you choose. Recently, I read something about the answers for the MBLEX. When test writers, test question writers are writing their questions, they choose four answers that are plausible. What is plausible? That are possible. 
they literally write answers that could be true. What? Hey, better that you know now so that you can systematically go through each answer and make sure there's not a better answer. That there's not a better answer at letter D. You cannot just pick the first right answer. So I'll pause there. Those are my test taking strategies for you today to understand what your experience is potentially going to be like in that Pearson View Testing Center. Hey, if you were going to go up against, uh, like if, if this is David and Goliath, right? You know the story from um, the Bible? David, Goliath, right? The big guy. And David's young and he's like, I'll take out the big guy and he's got a boomerang. Um, how likely is Go David going to be to take down Goliath? Eh, not likely, right? But, but as the story goes, he had been studying his boomerang. He was really good at the boomerang. Boomerang is a slingshot, actually. Slingshot. Um, and he took aim. He took aim at Goliath. And in one, in one rock, one throw, knocked him out. And oddly enough, I'm going to just give you one more little insight. There's a word that's used a lot. And the word is sin. Sin is actually an archery term. It means missing the mark. And so for those of you who have failed forward, all you did was miss the mark. No big deal. You get to wind up again and take another throw. This time, you're here and you're taking aim. Let's go do this thing. All right. Pathology for massage therapists. Woohoo. Yay. The stuff you need to know to practice safely. Welcome back. So glad you're here. So, in today's lesson, I wanted to show you what a pathology syllabus looks like. So a pathology syllabus is what you would have been given, maybe, um, in massage school. It is what your massage instructor would have been looking at, would have been teaching from, depending on what module or when pathology was introduced in your school. But let's take a look at what's on a full pathology syllabus. These are the things you could need to know. We're not going to cover them all today, but this is the syllabus. This is the starting point. So about bones, what would you need to know about pathology of bones? So what would you need to know about the pathology of bones? Postural deviations, osteoporosis, fractures. We're looking at things that go wrong, pathologies. We're looking at things that go wrong, pathologies of bones. Um, so postural deviations, osteoporosis, fractures. Let's understand a little bit about the pathology of joints, things that go wrong with joints. Your instructor may have been seeing something like arthritis, spondylolisthesis, spondylosis, bone spurs, subluxation, dislocation, chondromyalgia, whiplash, sprains, because strains are with muscles. This is joints, so we're talking about ligaments. Um, So some pathology of discs and also TMJ, the temporomandibular joint dysfunction, TMJ. What else might have been on your pathology syllabus? To identify and define conditions of connective tissue. So contractures, 
We've talked in the past about dupletins, contracture that affects a hand. It makes a hand go kind of like that. So contractures, tendonitis, tendonitis, bursitis, bunions. These are all conditions, dysfunctions of connective tissue. Bunions, lipomas, Baker's galleon, um, ganglion, ganglion cyst, other cysts, lupus, uh, plantar fasciitis, sprain. You also on your syllabus would have covered the pathologies uh, called myofascial pain. So, so this is muscular conditions, muscular pathologies. So we've talked in the past about my myofascial pain syndrome. Uh, we've talked about fibromyalgia, we've compared spasms, torticollis, um, periostesis, so the tibial stress um, syndrome, uh, adhesions, uh, strains, and of course sprains, uh, and then muscular dystrophy affects the musculature. So mental disorders are also something you could get asked about. Um, so affective disorders, anxiety disorders, uh, organic disorders, personality disorders, and conditions like schizophrenia. So again, terms to be familiar with. And I'll go ahead and post this pathology syllabus in the patron community so you can take a look at it again. Also pathologies that you would be asked to be familiar with. Diverticulitis, Crohn's, IBS, uh, the hiatal hernias, ulcers, colitis, those people who are lactose intolerant, um, knowing the condition of constipation, appendicitis, gastrointestinal inflammation, um, and things like polyps and colon cancer. To just understand what they are. These again, this is still your pathology syllabus. All the things you may be asked about. You may be asked about medical terminology, and I've given you just three slides here, but I could have given you about 25. So medical terminology like adhesions, assessment, avulsion, boundaries, I'm doing this in alphabetical order, contractile structures, simply those things that have the ability to con contract, muscles, tendons, um, contracture, what is it? Um, you know, that shortening of the, of the actual structure, the contracture, the shortening. Um, in this case, we're talking about connective tissue. Contraindication, crepitus, um, a fancy word for bone, a bruising or contusion. Um, ed um, <laughs> edamame, I was going to say, edema, uh, and then effects. These are all just terms. Again, I'll post these, the full medical terminology in the patron um, uh, on the patron site so that you can have it, you can print it, you can review it. So given that there's so much to cover, what are we gonna cover today? So today we're gonna talk about postural deviations. We're gonna talk about osteoporosis. We're gonna talk about arthritis. We're going to talk about fractures as well. So the pathology of skeletal conditions. So pathology that affects the skeletal system. I'm going to focus on that for a bit this morning, this afternoon. All right. Postural deviations. Postural what? Oh, my goodness. I was tutoring with a, a student uh, earlier in the week, and uh, they were asking about, there was an answer. Oops. there was an answer that had to do with the mandible and the word deviation. And so the movement of the mandible is to protract and retract, right? Protract, retract, but also lateral deviation. So lateral deviation. So postural deviation. So to deviate means to go away from the normal path. Right. If we deviate off our map, it's something that's abnormal. So um, we could say postural abnormalities 
or postural deviations. So what are some common postural deviations that you may be asked about on the emblex? You may be asked about, let's start from the right side. So the forward head tilt. So pathologies, a forward head tilt. The average head, how much does the average head weight? Can you put it in the chat? Let's see. Yay, Marina, you're very welcome. Deborah, you're welcome. I'm Uriel. All right, how much does the average head weigh? Can you stick it in the chat? I'll tell you in just a moment. But our head is kind of heavy. And so from being on the computer, from driving, from being on our phone, right? Do you ever like work on your phone and then all of a sudden you pick up your head and you're like, oh, oh, my neck, oh. Yeah, well, prolonged exposure, oh, see that forward head tilt can create tension here in the neck and in the mid back. So a kyphotic curve, we're gonna look at again, momentarily when we talk about osteoporosis, um, but a kyphotic curve affects the thoracic spine. This is hyperlordosis. Wait, uh, where are we? Hyperlordosis. So here's the funny thing about the spine. The angles all balance each other out. So you can't change one angle of the spine without it affecting other angles of the spine. So this kyphotic curve actually creates lordosis as well. Hyperlordosis, L, lordosis lumbar. Lordosis happens in the lumbar spine. Kyphosis, here in the thoracic spine. And we'll see that as uh, a condition of osteoporosis. It's considered a postural deviation. Here is just a straight flat back. Don't see that all that often. Here we see the military back, chested out, right? Look at that protruding chest. We get a little bit of the sway back. And this leads to the posterior pelvic tilt. So when your posterior, when that sway back, that's like when you have um, your pelvis is tucked under, your tailbone is tucked under. Sometimes we call it old man pants, right? The old man pants that get pulled up right to the, you know, way fast. Then their and their butt is kind of you can't even see it. It's all flat because it's tucked under. That is that is posterior pelvic tilt. All right. And so as our spine deviates, as our posture deviates, it affects our pelvic basin. It affects the forward, the anterior or posterior pelvic tilt. I like to think of it almost like a cup, right? If this is your pelvic basin. And so the handle ends up being kind of your butt, right? What your butt looks like. So when there's an anterior pelvic tilt, spills out the front. But look what happens to the butt. It's up in the air. In other lectures, I've used pictures of Kim Kardashian and Queen B, you know, that big old, that big old hiney, right? Well, part of it is the anterior pelvic tilt. Now, this is neutral. The posterior pelvic tilt, the butt tucks under. And you can see how, if I were to keep going, the T would spill out the back. These are postural deviations. Let's take a look at the next slide. Ideal posture. It is different for everybody. And so as you have clients on your table, as you're asked questions about this on the MBLEX, just know that ideal and what's comfortable for people is gonna be different for different folks. I mean, I've worked on, uh, oh, you know what's not in here? Scoliosis. S, scoliosis, S, spine. Scoliosis of the spine. 
I've worked with clients who have literally like a 45 degree angle in their spine. I mean, it's, it's like really noticeable, uncorrected. Normally as a child, they would connect, correct that with Harrington rods, but uncorrected. And she's not in pain. She exercises. It's just what her normal is. So just understand that normal is different for everybody. Pain, that we'd like to avoid. So people with postural deviations will seek out massage to address pain. Pain that's being caused possibly by this deviation. Let's talk a little bit about osteoporosis. So what is it? You've heard of it? Can you nail it? All right. It's a, it's a pathology where the bones become brittle. Osteoporosis, osteopenia, that's less severity. It's in the same family. Osteopenia is just the early stages of osteoporosis. So they're not two different conditions. They're basically the same condition. Osteoporosis is just the bones have become fragile. So osteopenia, there's been some bone mass loss. Well, what does that look like? Take a peek. All right. So you can see these symptoms of osteoporosis. Here's a healthy spine. Here's a little bit of a kyphotic curve. And then there's hyperkyphosis. Kyphosis or hyperkyphosis are both conditions of the thoracic spine. One is just a little less severe than the other, right? So kyphosis, hyperkyphosis, or hunchback. You know, that, that hunched back. Hunchback in Notre Dame. Did you read that in school? That hunched back. He had kyphosis. Yeah. So, and oftentimes because of the condition, the osteoporosis condition, these bones are brittle and it can lead to fracture. That's the danger. So let's take a look at what's actually happening in the bone with osteoporosis. And our session adaptation is to use less pressure. You're not going to be massaging directly on the bone anyhow. But if you're seeing a client with the condition of osteoporosis, what's happening is, take a look here. This is the normal density of a vertebrae. Look at the, um, the open airy parts here. This is what's happening with osteoporosis, the bone density loss. Next slide shows it a little more too. So normal bone, nice dense, right? Osteoporotic bone. So look at that word, osteoporotic. I just used it as an adjective. So I'm describing a bone. Sometimes these questions on the M blocks are going to be like, what? Are they talking about osteoporosis? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So bone density. And here we're highlighting an area in the lumbar spine that is vulnerable. You get this kyphosis here. And then all of a sudden, this like another big lordotic curve, hyperlordosis. And that's, again, because of weight bearing. That's where we're bearing some weight. That can be subject, uh, um, susceptible to fracture. So where are we most susceptible to fracture with osteoporosis? Hip, spine, and wrist. What are the risk factors for osteoporosis? Uh, gender, females get it more than males like nine out of 10 times, age, almost always elderly. An elderly person is getting osteoporosis, usually over 45, over 50, um, because their hormones have changed, right? Uh, Asian Americans uh, are like, so pale, uh, pale skin. So, um, so European women um, as well sometimes are subject. So white, fair skin, light hair, light bones, little birds, like the, we call them little birdie women, right? Um, so, and you'll see in another chart who doesn't get osteoporosis. Um, but body size, if you're small framed. Okay, thank you. So if you're small framed as well, you can be susceptible. So risk factors, age, gender, females, um, Caucasian and, and Asian race uh, tend to have uh, osteoporosis more. Um, inactive, low vitamin D, uh, low, uh, low estrogen. So after the age of 50, 55, as women's estrogen starts, production starts to go down, um, smoking can be a risk factor. Um, 
and quitting certain drugs can also be a, a risk factor. But let's take a look at the epidemiology of osteoporosis. And what the heck is epidemiology? Uh, so epidemiology, I'm going to just, in just a moment because I want to, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Epidemiology is the branch of medicine that deals with the incidence, distribution, and possible control of diseases and other factors relating to health. So technically, epidemiology is the study of pathology, the epidemiology of osteoporosis. So who gets it? What race is? So the epidemiology of osteoporosis. So that's branch of medicine that deals with the incidence, who gets it, the distribution, how many get it, um, and the possible control of those diseases. So, all right, so we're back to our regularly scheduled program. All right, so who gets it? Uh, in the US, uh, about 8 million women um, and 2 million, about 2 million out of the 8 million have it. Those are rough numbers. Um, so, one in three women, um, and then one in 12 men. 7% uh, are postmenopausal. Uh, who doesn't get it? Uh, Mexican American women. <laughs> they just don't get it. Um, about 10%, actually. Um, who does get it? Non Hispanic, non -Hispanic white women. Um, and uh, men of all ages, uh, you know, young and old, but only about 6%. Um, and black women also, rarely, about 5% of the time. So the epidemiology, so if you see that word on the emblex, it just means the study of. So the epidemiology, the study of osteoporosis, all sorts of statistics. Okay, and away we go. So how does it relate to massage therapy? Um, so how can you as a massage therapist assist uh, a client who's been diagnosed with osteoporosis. Well, uh, whether it's osteopenia or osteoporosis, recognizing those high-risk clients. Um, I think of them as like the little birdie clients, right? The the ones who are frail. Not only, not only, not just the old folks, right? Because old old ladies, old women, um, senior citizen women uh, do tend to be frail. However, um, I've had people who've gotten osteopenia, a diagnosis of osteopenia at 45. So recognizing those clients who are at high risk. Um, and if you think that they're having some symptoms, encouraging them to get seen by a doctor um, and using, uh, avoid using deep pressure techniques. Uh, we don't do any pressure on the spine anyhow but just be cognizant of and refrain from doing any massage techniques that could um, endanger um, or hurt, right? First, do no harm. And then uh, encouraging clients to do activities that build bone mass. So being proactive, saying, hey, I learned about osteoporosis in school and um, you know, what can be done to improve it. And I'll show you that slide in just a moment. The biggest risk factor for osteoporosis is that people don't know they have it. And they don't know they have it until they fall. So sometimes the first sign of osteoporosis is fracture. They've fallen and broken a hip. Yeah. So just knowing those early warning signs and what can be done to increase bone mass. Let me see. Oh. Thank you for answering the question, Ensley and Lana. Uh, the question that was early, asked earlier was, how heavy is your head? Eight to 12 pounds. So yes, you were both right, eight to 12 pounds. But at times they say the first sign of an artery being blocked is a heart attack, right? Um, well, sometimes the first sign of osteoporosis is uh, falling and fracturing. Yeah. So just being aware um, of who is in that high risk factor and advising them on what they can do for prevention. And there are lovely things like this that you could even hang in your office or have as a handout um, that talks about osteoporosis uh, for those um, 
those women or men uh, who are at, at high risk factors. So again, it's the gender is mostly women, elderly, white, um, and frail. Those are the high risk factors. You might get asked about that on the MLEX. Um, and prevention. How can we prevent? So for those of you who are certified in personal training, you know the answer to this. You can do weight bearing exercise. That is one of the best ways to stop the progression of osteopenia. Weight bearing exercise. So go to the gym, carry your groceries, weight bearing, body weight exercises um, are also great. Um, so that's a uh, weight bearing exercise. I thought I had a picture of it, but here you see in this little corner, the prevention, right? Um, so eat foods that are high in calcium and high in vitamin D. Our body doesn't actually produce vitamin D. We have to get it from outside sources. And one of the easiest ways to get it is sunlight. You know, the universe didn't make no fool. They know we don't make vitamin D. So they give us sunlight. We can get it from just 15 minutes of sunlight. Um, is one way to get vitamin D. Yeah. And that's why it's also fortified in milk, right? So dairy products. But for some people, they're um, lactose intolerant and they can't use dairy products. We'll see in just a moment other sources of vitamin D for them. Um, vitamins and supplements, avoid smoking and drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So ways to prevent the progression of osteo. A good diet that includes calcium and vitamin D. Um your bones store about 99% of the calcium. However, the vitamin D helps your body absorb the calcium. So what's the role of vitamin D? Helps your body, your bones absorb the calcium. So both are important. Um, but what if you can't drink milk or you can't have dairy? Um, you can get vitamin D in broccoli and kale, in oranges, apricots, salmon, almonds. But the best way, the very best way, you know, of course, improve your diet, don't smoke, don't drink too much. Um, but the very best way is that weight bearing exercise, osteoporosis, to help stop the progression of the disease, weight bearing exercise. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the difference. We're going to move into the third category. Well, not our third stage, but the last category of learning today. And that is the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. What? What do you mean? We have to know the difference between these two types of arthritis? Um, yeah, you do, because uh, they're really different. Most common, right? The mo what's most common is osteoarthritis. All right. Ready to dissect some questions? Now we only have a few today. So take a breath. In fact, let's just take a moment. I know it's almost one o'clock. Let's see. Yep, but just take a breath. And exhale. Go ahead. Do it again. Take a breath. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. See if you can make it make a sound. Like, like a blowing sound, like you're blowing out candles. Make a little whoosh sound, a little sound if you want. You need to get rid of some old stress. Blow it out. Take in the cool, clean air. Blow out that warmth, that mud, that old stress out. That is a technique you can use during your, your emblex. Yeah, just take a breath in. Oxygen helps to deliver more information to the brain and blow out. Imagine you're blowing out like a dragon, the year of the dragon, right? You're blowing out fire. You're blowing out. You're getting it out. You're getting out the mud, the yuck, the dark, the, the heat. Out. Yeah. Good. Let's go into our questions. How is vitamin D obtained? Vitamin D is obtained through diet and sunlight. 
through B, all forms of milk. C, supplements, we don't make it in our body. D, food that starts with D, such as dairy, dark chocolate, and dragon fruit. Okay, how can one prevent osteoporosis and osteopenia? How can one prevent osteoporosis or osteopenia? A, long distance running. B, walking. C, you can't avoid it, it's genetic. D, weight bearing exercise. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get rid of the one we know is wrong. Long distance running is not going to help you with osteoporosis. That is not going to be a good idea if you have osteopenia. Whoa, everybody's got an answer. All right, let's, oh, yay. All right, I'm going to just say, I want to say your name. I want to say your name. Um, good. All right, I'm going to go backwards. All right, Tammy, yes, good. Valerie, yes. Angie, yes. Uh, Ms. V, you're in. Uh, Nucha, you got it. Yes. Diana, you got it. Enzi, you got it. Marina, yes. Anastasia, yes. Latrice, uh-huh. Kijo, yep. Tiffany, good. Mimi, you got it. Yep. Yolanda, you're in. Good. And it is, out of those answers, weight-bearing exercise. So walking is lovely, but, and it's good to stay active, but weight-bearing exercise. Absolutely the best answer there. And, you know, if it's in your genes, can you avoid it? It's actually good to know if your mom had it or your aunt had it. Um, then it's good to know that you can prevent it by um, some of those ways we've talked about. Good job. And now you know, too, that osteopenia is the early stage of osteoporosis. Other ways, uh, lifestyle modifications, calcium D. Yeah, and so, yeah, and so depending on the stage of osteopenia, uh, of osteoporosis, uh, don't fall. Like if you have osteoporosis, just don't fall. Don't go skiing, you know? Final question. What is the difference between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis? Oh, it's not the last question. Sorry, we have one more. But the difference between rheumatoid and osteo. Let's look at the answers. One is in old people and one is in young people. Osteo is a degenerative disease. Rheumatoid is an autoimmune disease. C, with osteo, you can tell when the weather is going to change. With rheumatoid, you hurt all over. And D, they are basically the same. Can you see how each of these answers has elements of the truth and could be plausible? Well, there's one that's not plausible. Let's get rid of that one. D. They're not basically the same. Therapist, and because you guys are on the path, I know this about you. I know it's your calling. So thanks for being here and answering the call. You're doing it. Nice. So. Signing off for today, as I mentioned, I'll hang out here with uh, the students who are in class, our graduates who are here in class, um, but we'll see you again real soon.